Unleash your true potential. How to reinvent yourself in times of crisis. Salima Wadnan. Are you tired and frustrated with living a mediocre life? Would you like to learn some techniques to reinvent yourself, especially during the times of crisis like COVID pandemic that we are going through? Then you're in the right place. In this interview, our guest Salima Vellani will be sharing her personal success story and practical strategies on how to reinvent yourself in times of crisis and unleash your true potential. She'll be discussing practical tools like finding your sweet spot, 100 coffee challenge, a design thinking toolkit. Give us a thumbs up if you'd like to learn these tools to unleash your true potential. Thank you, friends, for joining us. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. So Salima Vellani is an award-winning serial entrepreneur, keynote speaker, professor, and author of Innovation Starts With I. For over 12 years, Salima has led 100 plus international organizations, not-for-profit, Fortune 500 companies to their next stage of growth and innovation. Currently, Salima and her team at Triple Impact run a business accelerator program to educate, advise, and connect entrepreneurs who are seeking to increase their influence and maximize their impact. She also teaches design thinking and entrepreneurship at Johns Hopkins University and is, is a frequent guest lecturer at business schools. And if this is the first time you're joining us, my name is Dr. Rosina, and I've been helping you with stress, anxiety, and depression on this platform. Over the last 20 years, I have been serving as a, a medical doctor specializing in psychiatry, a best-selling author, and a transformative speaker. I started this program, Happy and Healthy Mind, with Dr. Rosina because I truly believe that a lot of suffering can be prevented with mind training. So we share practical tips for your mental fitness here so you don't have to suffer unnecessarily. These interviews are broadcasted live every Saturday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. If you're joining us live, you can ask the questions by putting them in comment section. Please note that we won't be able to give any treatment advice and we encourage you to talk to your healthcare professional. Our purpose is to empower you with education. So although we cannot give treatment advice, we can send you the resources and reminders so you could ask the questions during the live broadcast next time. You can text word joyful to the number 38470 to get those links or join our Facebook group, Happy and Healthy Mind by clicking the link in the description. And the, the purpose of this program is to bring health and happiness to a million people. So if you find any value in these programs, like, subscribe, and share, so more people can be helped to live happier and healthier life. So today our topic is unleash your true potential, how to reinvent yourself in times of crisis. So let's ask Salima. Salima, tell us, how did this topic become important in your life? Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. It's an honor. So Dr. Rosina, for me, it has been very much a life where I was, it started off when, you know, early on in my career when I graduated into a crisis. And so for me, I had no choice but to use my survival mode to get creative and figure out what to do. And so I, you know, in 2008, 2009, when I graduated from college, I had no choice but to reinvent myself when I couldn't find a job. And I wanted to live abroad in Brazil and Italy. And so the first thing I did was, you know, I went and did, you know, service work. I went and did volunteer work in Brazil and said, you know, if I can't get what I want, at least let me give something before I take. And so I went and did some volunteer work to help uh, co-found and start up this language school in Brazil to finance an orphanage. And it was really an interesting experience. I had no idea. I thought I would go down to, to do volunteer work and work with kids, but essentially they wanted me to, it was having a good leader. Like my, my leader there, the entrepreneur was a very great mentor to me. And he said, you'd be perfect to start this language school in Rio that will help finance our orphanage to keep our operations going and to help improve the orphanage. And it was that only that I said, wow, I can sol help solve this problem. And I was on it pretty much, you know, I, I did was able to build a team and, and work with some other people, but I was the lead person on the ground. And it was a very challenging experience being in another country in a different language, starting something in a country where there's a lot of regulations and a lot of it was just really challenging. And I didn't know that I was becoming an entrepreneur, I was unleashing, you know, my potential through that experience. It was very challenging living without water, 
all the difficulties on the ground, just getting something going. But as soon as we found our sweet spot, which I'll talk about soon, as an organization, we were a nonprofit at the time. Now it's a for-profit social enterprise. But it was essentially really figuring out, hey, what are we really good at? How are people perceiving us? We were trying to do too many things. And I think that a lot of times when we're in that process of needing to reinvent ourselves, we don't know where to start. And I think that that's where self-awareness is really key. And as, a, as an organization, what we did was really look at what are we really good at? What are people kind to us for? And, you know, seeing ourselves through these different lens, which, you know, therapy and, and different tools out there are great, uh, which we'll talk about soon. But essentially really realizing that our niche was not so much teaching all these different languages, which we were able to do being from different countries, all, our, all the volunteers, but really going for, you know, Portuguese for foreigners. That's what people were interested in. That's, we had the foreigners as our main market. They were interested in contributing to the orphanage and seeing the kids and, and all of that. And so I think that really trying to figure out, you know, you have to go through this pivot point. Oftentimes we go through these life quakes. For me, that was a, I would say like one of my life quakes where kind of like an earthquake that happens in your life where you have to reinvent. And I think at that point I was being a bit proactive about it when I realized, you know, I can't, I can't do much. Let me go figure out what I want to do. Uh, but there's also been other times in my life where I was more reactive when it came to reinventing. So I think the key is to to really embrace being proactive in that reinvention process and not wait for everything to fall apart. And I can tell you a story about that later when my house oh, burned down. I remember like, <laughs> had a personal life experience when like, you know, things really turned upside down for you after making it. So tell us about that story, because I think that was very inspiring for me. Yeah, sure. So that story, this very house, my, my home here in Washington, D.C., after I picked up and I was an entrepreneur earlier in my career, without realizing I was an entrepreneur, I went and worked. I went and said, you know, my goal was to work a nine to five job. That's what my that's what I grew up. My parents are like, you know, go get a stable, stable job. There's no such thing as that anymore. But that was what I was trying to do and climb this ladder and, you know, have this stable career. And I started that and that didn't seem to really be what fulfilled me. I really missed the life of being an entrepreneur. I really missed the creativity, the freedom, the ability to express my creative self. And I felt really like I was suffocating in, in that nine to five. And I didn't feel like I was having the impact I set out to make. And so I actually sought therapy at that point. And, you know, it was like, you know, a friend of mine was like, Salima, you have some things about yourself you don't know. And there's some deep rooted things you have to discover about yourself. And maybe you should go seek professional help. And it was really hard because I never grew up with that and I never really was encouraged to seek therapy. And it was really getting that professional help, getting therapists, coaches, getting a lot of that help that I was able to do a lot of that introspection and actively do something about it. But with all of that being said, I was staying in that situation where I was comfortable, where I was in that job, or I was not really listening to my inner voice. And because I wasn't doing anything about it, things just started happening in my life. You know, I, I thought I had made this really successful career transi transition, my corporate exit. And then all of a sudden, you know, I got laid off from my two new jobs. I, my house, this very house here burnt down. There was a really bad fire in my building. I was really sad to see my relationship fell apart. Like everything was just going one thing after the other, after the other. And I didn't know how to handle it other than just, I went into panic mode, but I was like, you know what? Like maybe someone told me that this is a blessing in disguise. Like you've been putting this off and you've been staying in the situation and not valuing yourself and not doing something about it. And so I was being, you know, reactive about it instead of proactive. And when I was displaced for several months, I decided, you know what, I'm going to take some time off of life for a bit and I'm not going to go in to seek a job right away. I'm going to go, you know, I'm out for several months from this house. Let me go travel, which for me, traveling has always been a source of personal growth. And so I went to India, to Bali, to Thailand, went on this eat, pray, self-love trip and really spent time alone to, to really discover who am I and what is my purpose? Because I think that throughout our lives, we're constantly, when we have these life quakes, they're almost a sort of awakening for us to discover who are we in this moment. And so that was kind of your, before you started applying some of these tools that you're going to teach us today, after you applied those things, how's your life now? <laughs> Yeah, great question. So when I applied a lot of that, well, what happened was I did a lot of that inner work, right? And I think that oftentimes we think that a lot of that we have to search outside and I used a lot of tools. I was doing a lot of yoga, meditation, a lot of mindfulness practice, and they were all tools that were helpful in my journey. But at the end of the day, I still had to face myself. 
And I think what I did that was really helpful was I got out of my shell because I was very embarrassed about my situation, you know, not having a job, not having a home, having everything sort of fallen apart. More things even happened. You know, my stepsister passed away. Just so many things were happening and I, I didn't know how to handle it. And so what I did was I actually met, I started meeting people for coffee and I said, you know, I'm going to keep my calm. I'm going to start meeting people for coffee um, and and start to figure out like what I'm going to do next in my next chapter. And, but even that I was starting, I was, I was sort of putting that off because I was a bit embarrassed about my situation. And it was only when I was denied entry, I'm Canadian. So I was denied entry into the United States, Toronto Pearson airport that I really was given two weeks. I was given two weeks by the immigration officer to come into the country and find a job or find some kind of job that would sponsor my visa. And given I was in my survival mode again, I was like, well, what am I going to do? And, and I, I couldn't do anything on my own. So I was like, you know, let me go. F I have to find a job and I have to get out of my shell and I need to go talk to people and see who can help me. And so I went into my network and I contacted, you know, tons of people and met with, I think about a hundred people over the course of two weeks, just scheduling coffee after coffee, um, some virtual, but mostly, you know, do a few here at this shop and another in this organization and just bash them and happy hours and dinners and breakfast. Like I was just meeting, I just went into to survival mode, into hustle mode. And I'm like, I'm just going to go do this because I, I couldn't imagine going back to Canada and not being able to come back into the United States, which, you know, is my home. And, and so I, yeah, that it was very interesting how just doing that practice, it was very much out of my, out of my comfort zone, but it landed me a couple of job offers and reconnected. And I think just being authentic and vulnerable when I was sharing with people without, without being draining about it or without trying to dump it on them, but just be like, Hey, this is what's going on, but maintaining my cool and my, you know, staying grounded. Uh, people were actually more willing to help than I expected. And that's what was very surprising about that exercise. And now I call it the 100 coffee challenge, which I'm happy to share with you, but there's a tool that we use to manage that. But whenever you're feeling stuck or you're in a crisis mode, I always think it's important to first go to your community, build more community, go and talk to people. And I think you learn a lot about yourself as well as, you know, the next chapter that you may want to pursue. Yeah. And we'll go into that technique in just a minute, but I want to, I want you to share like, how does the life feel different now after you have applied these tools? Yeah. So life is, I think for me, I know how to handle things much better because I've been through so much, so many of those, confidence. Um, the confidence, the knowing that I can lean on other people and that people can lean on me as well. And I try to always give as well to other people that are trying to, to navigate their own crisis when their careers are, or especially with entrepreneurs right now. And I think that I, it just feels like I, I have everything I need. Like I feel much more fulfilled for many years. I felt there's a sense of emptiness and I had to go search and it was actually through one of my coffees during that time, this old man, he was a meditator and professional meditator. And he told me, stop searching. Like I was coming out with all everything that was going on in my life and I didn't know what to do. And I was seeking help. And all he said was stop searching. And I think that advice I still use today. And whenever I feel like I'm in that mode of trying to panic or whatever, something's not going on, I just say, you know, just stop and take a breath and, and use some of these tools that we're going to share soon. Yeah. So I think I'm excited to learn and share with our viewers, but let me just ask this question to people. If you were in a crisis, what, uh, have you ever been in a crisis in your life? Like Salima has been. And if there was one thing that helped you, please share it, share in the comment section, what one thing has helped you in your crisis time? And let's hear, while you're putting the answers in the comment section, let's ask Salima if she can go a little deeper in the tools that, sh that have helped her. Yeah, sure. So looking forward to some of your comments. I would love to know from you guys as well, how many of you have sort of struggle to find what you're very good at or what is it that you need to be doing? You kind of feel like there's some sort of emptiness. You're not maximizing your potential. Our theme is for today's conversation. And so what I have is this tool, Rosina, feel free to share it. It's called Finding Your Sweet Spot. And it's essentially a tool to help people discover what is it that they're really, really good at that they can um, sort of, you know, how can they unleash their potential? And so I have this tool that I developed. It's actually in a, 
it's an extension or I adopted it actually after learning about the Johari window several years ago and working on it, I was like, how, how can I, you know, the Johari window is a great tool for, for improving your self-awareness through the different lens, through your, you know, your own lens, as well as through the lens of other people. And so the Johari window, feel free to look it up. Um, I basically decided to create a more actionable model around that and a framework that people can actually use in today's world based on seeing their life as a series of projects. I think that oftentimes we see our careers and our lives very chronologically, you know, based on the different jobs we've had. And I encourage you to really map out and feel free to take, you know, I like to do it. I actually like to take use sticky notes and use a flip chart or do it on a whiteboard or even on a mirror board if you're more comfortable doing it virtually and really map out all the different projects that you've done throughout your career, whether they're personal projects, like writing a book, starting a podcast, some volunteer work you've done through projects you've done in the different jobs you've had. And then take those projects and really think about, you know, which are the projects that you really excelled at, you know, that you know that you're confident in those skills and other people know that you have those skills too. And then in the top left quadrant, you have that there. So stick some of those projects in that quadrant. And then what are the projects that you received really great feedback on? So the projects that people were like, wow, I really admire you for, for this, or you did a really great job at this. And, and even just in your 100 coffee challenges, just go and talk to some people that you know and say, hey, what is something that I've done really, really well? Or what's something that I've done that's inspiring? And it's very surprising that sometimes people see us very different than the way we see ourselves. Uh, we can often be very hard on ourselves or we don't see the way, you know, see the impact that we make through the lens of other people. So it's important to ask and to, to gain that perspective by seeking feedback and list those projects there in the top right corner. And then what are the projects that gave you the most joy that really unleashed you? You would do for free because you really enjoy doing them so much that they they're just, you're just so passionate about them. And then let's list that on your the bottom left corner. And then the interesting part, and this is where a lot of innovation happens. And, you know, this is where a lot of us don't really tap into our, you know, into our unleashed potential is in the bottom right corner, uh, the open to testing quadrant. And that's where, you know, these are the projects that you've been keeping on the back burner. They're sort of been in the back of your mind. They might be keeping you up at night. They're, they're things that, you know, you really want to do, but you're uh, I'm not sure, like they're out of your comfort zone and you're not sure how to really make them happen. And you might need to take some baby steps towards them and, you know, set up some smaller, you know, scale back a little bit and figure out how you can set up smaller projects to actually make them happen. So whether you're, you know, wanting to write a book or, you know, do some poetry or just do something that, you know, become an entrepreneur or a lot of people are doing that these days. And these are projects that you're willing to test. And I really encourage you to list those. And that's, it's really interesting because when you look at it and you have all those projects, you'll kind of see some patterns and you'll realize, hmm, how can I actually take some of those projects that are, you know, open to testing and figure out what this, what skills I have, what experience I have, what I really love and, and really make it happen. How can you motivate yourself to do that? And that's when we actually unleash our uh, potential. When we try those projects and we start to realize, wow, I discovered something that I didn't know that I had or existed. For me, it was, you know, sharing my story, public speaking, writing a lot of different things that I was so scared or so nervous about before. And it was doing them in baby steps and realizing how impactful they were. So I really encourage you to to get to know that more. And yeah, it's a it's a fun tool to to use. So I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Yes, that was very powerful. And I'm going to do that. And I encourage everybody who's listening to do that. I just want to share a couple of people answering the question they are saying that they deal with their crisis situation by walking away or getting away from the situation. And thank you for sharing that answer because that is the immediate thing you need to do. Like Salima was saying, you know, um, just she was searching so much that even things that are right over there, she was not able to see. And somebody saying that stop searching and look what you, what's in front, realize that, become aware and that allowed her to move on. And so sometimes we are so much in the middle of like, you know, that crisis and getting in that reaction, just walking away, taking a few moments helps us calm down. And then we can come back and do something like what Rima was describing, finding your sweet spot so you can focus on your full potential and bring it out and break those barriers. You know, sometimes we feel like there are limitations. I can't do this because of this. I can't do this because of this. And so we find ourselves bound by these limitations. But many times, some of those limitations are created by ourselves. Earlier, you were saying that the biggest limitation in our path is ourselves. Yes. Yeah. 
it's it's our mindset that we kind of create. So there are definitely, there are limitations. Not everybody can do everything. If I have glasses, I cannot be an astronomer. Well, that's what I was told. <laughs> but, you know, there are certain limitations that you may be facing because of which you can't do certain things. Yeah, so I think it's really going back to actually have another tool that's in my digital workbook of my book, Innovation Starts with I, which is coming out in a few months, the spring in April 2021, and which really aims to redefine innovation. But essentially, there's a part where, you know, it's about getting out of your comfort zone and going beyond your limiting beliefs. And so I actually have this tool where you really list, and you can even just do this, um, taking some post-it notes. I do used to do this a lot in workshops is really trying to figure out what are my limiting beliefs around things? Am I not good enough? I'm not smart enough. I'm not whatever it is. And oftentimes we tell ourselves, this is very human. You know, we tell ourselves a lot of stories that aren't true. And we really have to do that work to reframe those limiting beliefs. And so when you take a moment to take a few, few minutes actually, and just really think about your limiting beliefs and Feel them in your body. Like it can be hard initially, but as soon as you start coming up with some of them around the stories that you're telling yourself that are not necessarily true, you'll start to see how many actually come out. And it's it's a very powerful exercise. And then I want you to actually then take a few minutes to figure out how you can reframe those limiting beliefs and change them, you know, shift your mindset and not just go from, you know, negative to positive, but actually turn them into empowered actions. So you actually take them and say, well, what's a baby step I can do to get better at this or change the way I'm stating this. And so, for example, I would have been like, you know, I'm not good at public speaking because I was so terrified of it my entire life until just a few years ago. And so then I said, you know what? I got invited through my coffee challenge to, you know, do a TEDx style talk at this women in tech conference. And I was like, you know what? There's no one else on my team that can do this. I can't delegate this to anyone. I'm just going to try it. It's very out of my comfort zone to go on a stage and share, but I'm going to do it. It's a, you know, I don't know anyone. What am I going to lose? It's I'll try it out. Or I, I had other opportunities that came my way when I started shifting my limiting beliefs to empowered actions and just doing those baby steps of trying new things. I started to realize what I was really, really good at and what I had, you know, it was interesting how I often told myself a lot of things that weren't true. And then there's some things that you might not be as great at, but at least, you know, you tried and you get over that and then you can laugh about it later. That's wonderful. Thank you. So wasn't it kind of related to that design thinking tool that you were talking about? What was that? That was intriguing. Yeah. So design thinking is a, you know, it's a creative process for problem solving. And so I was working in the design thinking space for, for a few years. And I even teach design thinking now at Johns Hopkins and design thinking. It's really a way of it's a process where you really get to empathize first with um, the people that you're solving a problem for. And, and then you go ahead and define the problem and then you ideate brainstorm solutions and then you prototype and test the solution that you want to, you know, to test and iterate. And so with the design thinking space, I actually realized for all those years, I was like, well, there's something missing from this. Cause I really think it's hard to dive into empathy and really try to empathize with your audience or your customers or your users. And I realized that self-awareness was missing from that and that it's important to, to be able to empathize and you have to be able to have self-awareness because there's a certain skill that's in order to really understand other people, you really have to first understand yourself, uh, especially since, you know, the relationships we have with others are all, it really depends on our relationship with ourselves and how we interact with ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves, how we treat ourselves. And so I think that self-awareness is missing from the design thinking process and starts with self-acceptance, you know, really trying to accept ourselves as we are and our faults, we're not, we're human and that human piece of innovation. And so my book does talk a lot about, you know, self-awareness and the different capabilities that are needed in the future of work, which we're already in. And so design thinking, I, I really try to, it is a great tool. It's a great process, but I do think that we have to look beyond just empathy and start with self-awareness and all leaders and all people need to develop that capacity to understand themselves. Yeah. And I feel like we can also apply in our own life because our life is our business. Our mind is the CEO. And so we have to run the business of this life in the most efficient manner because we only have one life to live. So we can apply a lot of those tools that we try to help other people to help ourselves too. So you were talking about your book. Tell us a little bit more about your book. 
Yeah, sure. So my book, it's really trying to redefine innovation and bring out that human element of innovation, like I mentioned. And so it is coming out in April 2021. So this spring, it's already, it's it's almost done. It's just being edited right now. So it's in the final stages, which is really exciting. Uh, I spent a couple of years on it. I actually started it back in 2014. And was told by somebody, you know, you're not ready to write a book yet. You haven't accomplished enough. And so I parked it for five years. I don't even know if that was good advice or bad advice. Cause I, I just, you know, I, I just don't know the answer to that, but I can say that, you know, it was great that I had the opportunity to live and go through that life quaking and, and I have so much more to share now. And so it's a lot of my personal story as well as, you know, I interviewed when I felt stuck uh, about a year and a half ago, I went out and interviewed over 100 leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators to really get their insights because I didn't want to just have the book be what's on my mind. And I wanted, I, I know that I, you know, we're, we're always influencing as well as being influenced by other people. So for me to bring out the best of my own story and my own insights, I knew that it was important to talk to other people. So I interviewed all sorts of leaders. You know, I interviewed Alex Osterwalder who created the business model canvas. I interviewed Ariana Huffington just a few months ago, some really great insights. And so it really is a, there's a lot of love that I put into the book. I also went and traveled. One of my, a few of my interviewees had told me, you know, go and talk to entrepreneurs in different countries. And so I, I went and facilitated design thinking workshops and visited entrepreneurs in Liberia and Panama and Morocco and Portugal. And I really wanted to, you know, understand what was the situation in those countries. And it was interesting that I learned that the world is, you know, so much smaller than we think. And the book really covers those, a lot of the lessons that I've learned through my own journey and my own story, but also a lot of actionable advice, tools, frameworks, and the 12 future capabilities or human capabilities that we need to thrive. So looking forward to it. Looking forward to it too. So we were ta- we have been talking about different ways of not getting stuck because of any crisis and reinventing yourself coming out. What if we don't do these proactive steps and don't try to find alternative ways? What would happen? Yeah, so if we're not being proactive in our reinvention process, what happens is that a lot of things start piling up and we don't realize it until it's too late. And then we become aware, wow, this is really, really bad situation and how do I get out of it now? And it often is too late to, to make a lot of changes without going through a lot of work to get there. And it can be often, you know, traumatizing for people to go through those experiences like myself when I went through some of those life quakes. And I think that we can avoid that by being very aware of who we are and where we are. You know, I think only 10 to 15% of people are actually self-aware. Most people think that they're self-aware. And so I think constantly checking in with ourselves, taking care of ourselves, being really proactive and constantly staying in touch with, you know, people that your, your support network, I like to call it your solidarity squad, your mentors, your colleagues, your, your close friends, the people, you know, your circle of five, the people that are closest to you, as well as, um, you know, just being a hybrid printer, which I talk about in my book, where you're constantly in, you know, you don't have to be just an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, but as you mentioned, we are all in a way entrepreneurs and we are the CEOs of our, our lives, which are our businesses. And so really think about your life as a portfolio and what are the things that you're doing that are keeping you in your growth or learning zone? What are the things that you're doing that are your passion projects and how can you consistently keep up with your passion projects and keep yourself fueled? What are the things that you're, you know, earning your profit or revenue from your income and making sure that you take care of yourself financially and you don't always have to combine, you know, what you do for a living versus your passion. And if you are very, if you're practicing this and you're also giving back to the community and making an impact, I think there's a certain merge that happens. And then all of these different components sort of blend a little bit and, and then eventually you'll end up living the life that, that, that you really want, but you do have to pay your dues. You do have to do that work and you do have to be very proactive in that reinvention process. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And so before we go into the special of the day, let me just share with the audience that they can get the resource that Salima is going to share by texting the word joyful to the number 38470. And they'll send you the link that would give you the access to her her tool about the 100 coffee challenge and the tool of the sweet spot. And, and then we'll also share how to get access to her book as it comes out. And she's been doing a lot of other work also that we can refer to in the document. And so it's time for, for the special. So are you ready? So today's special, I want to keep it simple and want to share a poem that really inspired me. And so I'm going to read the poem. Walking down the road one day on a dreary rainy afternoon, 
I met a man laughing and smiling like a loon. I asked him why he was so happy, joyous as can be. He looked at me and smiled, told me how he'd reached out to every man and child. He's lit a fire in their hearts, shown the path for them to follow, been a breath of fresh air, told them to make their own tomorrow. Before, he has been rejected, shunted out, refused, neglected, been treated like an outsider, a flickering light, a fading star. They had all, however, come back to ask for guidance, for help. They came back, all of them, to seek the wisdom that they lack. This man inspires with a kind heart. This man is a guide. His spirit is truly a work of art. This man's name, Hope. Hope is your guiding light. So no matter how bad the life feels like, you can always, always feel that there are other ways, other opportunities that you can find and so keep that hope alive keep striving try to be better even just one percent keep getting better one percent and you would be able to live your best life on that message stay happy healthy and safe see you next time